Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is my console, your host. Before we begin this episode, I want to alert you that my latest book is now available in both print and ebook formats. The title is Love American Style, and it is a collection of short stories about men, women, their passions, and their dysfunctions. There's a short link in the episode notes that will take you to my Amazon profile page where all four of my books are listed. Three novels in this new short story collection. Again, the title of the new one is Love American Style, named after the TV series that ran from 1969 until 1974. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Tom Zollner, the author of nine nonfiction books, including Island on Fire, The Revolt That Ended Slavery in the British Empire, which is the winner of the uh, National Book Critic Circle Award for the Best Nonfiction Book of 2020 and a finalist for the Bancroft Prize in the California Book Award. He works as a professor at Chapman University and Dartmouth College and as an as editor-at-large for the Los Angeles Review of Books. Uh, his writing has appeared in, in uh, The Atlantic, in Harper's, uh, The American Scholar, The Oxford American, Time, Foreign Policy, Men's Health, Slate. The list goes on, also including the Los Angeles and the New York Times and Wall Street Journal uh, and, and publications beyond that. Um, he is a former staff writer at the Arizona Republic and at the uh, San Francisco Chronicle and the recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Lannan Foundation. Tom Zollner, welcome to the program. Uh, thanks, Mike. It's good to be here. Good to have you. Uh, I see that, uh, I mean, you, the, the, your territories and mine overlap a bit. Uh, did you grow up in Tucson? Is that home to you? I did indeed grow up in Tucson, Arizona. Where'd you go to college from there? Where, are you a, are you, were you a wildcat, University of Arizona wildcat? You know, briefly, I spent a freshman year there and uh, it just wasn't for me. So I uh, transferred to a school in the Midwest, uh, Lawrence University. Lawrence University, okay. Um, and then uh, I noticed, uh, I was very interested to see you spend time at the Arizona Republic. I had spent years in Arizona, uh, uh, Arizona State grad myself, but, uh, you know, from the Northeast originally. Uh, was When you were at the Republic, was was uh, Tom Fitzpatrick there at the time, the columnist, or had he already gone over to New Times? Fitzpatrick was at the the New Times, and uh, he had a certainly carved out an identity as a, a hard-hitting Chicago guy who uh, took no crap from anyone. Yeah. <laughs> Even his um, his column mug, which which was a stipple, had an angry face on it. It was just like, <laughs> you know, don't, don't, mess with, don't mess with Tom Fitzpatrick. Uh, but when he went over to the New, to New Times, though, um, he seemed to um, uh, soften up. But not, not that he wasn't uh, cracking skulls. It was just it didn't seem that he was putting as much... Uh, effort in did you ever meet the man i never did his reputation preceded him though yes what about uh you're familiar with new times i don't know if you ever crossed paths with mike lacy one of the co-founders and the editor uh yeah so uh i did uh lacy has had some um some legal problems to say the least uh i was asked to uh do a story on um his uh arc such as it was from uh revolutionary um, to uh, defendant uh, in uh, Phoenix Magazine for an issue a um, uh, couple months ago. What are his legal problems? I didn't. I'm not up to date on that. Lacey and uh, Jim Larkin, who uh, were co-founders of uh, New Times when it was a, um, uh, a kind of a radical uh, alternative paper, started out of Arizona State University. Uh, they went on to found something called Backpage, which. Uh, was where uh, all the uh, advertisements for uh, Vice, uh, uh, outcall right. services, that sort of thing. I remember it. So yeah. they sold, didn't they sell the newspaper, but they retained Backpage? They w had gone online by then and they retained that. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, the federal government alleged that this was a front for uh, sex trafficking. And what followed was a, a long uh, legal soap opera which um, eventually resulted in uh, one conviction uh, out of a number of counts. And I, the conviction, if I remember correctly, was for uh, alleged money laundering. Wow. That is some legal trouble there. <laughs> um, you remember back in the day, I mean, Janet Boomersbach was kind of the face of New Times 
back when it was first busting out. I mean, after Lacey and Larkin had started the magazine, she just died, what, a week ago or something like that, just days ago. I don't know if you heard about that. Yes, God rest her soul. Jana was wonderful. Um, uh, always, uh, always friendly, generous, um, a lot of institutional knowledge there. Uh, she wasn't afraid of uh, asking questions of powerful people and also a, a darn good historian in her own right. Yeah, she wrote uh, some uh, books herself. Um, um, now, you got into the book writing business. Uh, how long? I mean, how long ago was it, Tom, that you decided that you wanted to be a writer? Oh boy, um, well, was I suppose, this a childhood thing or junior yeah, high? I guess or it what? was a childhood until, thing. Yeah, uh, yeah probably uh, at. Uh, uh, look out Mountain Elementary School in uh, North Phoenix, Arizona, which is where 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 the idea, the uh, uh, somewhat troubling idea, first began to form that maybe this could be a credible way to uh, to try and make a life. <laughs> troubling in what regard? <laughs> well, I mean, even then, even to uh, a grade schooler, it was apparent that this was going to be uh, hardly a uh, uh, an easy economic path. Uh, <laughs> There was a series of books uh, uh, called Harriet the Spy. You're probably familiar oh, with yeah. them. <laughs> that's, yes. In fact, that that's a major, uh, you know, that's an important book from my past. I, I, this is only the second time I've heard it on the podcast, but yes. What did that do for you? Well, there was a character there that uh, the author, Louise Fitzhugh, had created. You know, Harriet's friend Sport had a father who was a, a writer who um, was a divorce guy. And uh, the way that she portrayed this guy's life was just one of tortured economic precarity. And, um, you know, the, the, this guy like took naps in the middle of the day and had nightmares. And there was a line in there that um, Harriet guessed that being a writer meant having a lot of nightmares and he could never find any money to take care of his son. And um, I, I think that was Louis Fitzhugh's way of sort of warning off uh, younger readers from the idea that you know, they, 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 they should be writing for a living. Now, um, how did your desire to write books develop? How did you prep yourself? Did you go through any kind of formal training? Did you do workshops or was this the sort of thing that uh, you, you did some newspaper work, understood how to report, how to structure a story, obviously a story and a book are two different things, but um, what, how did you really uh, see yourself developing to the point where you wrote your first one? Sure. Well, um, joining the staff of a metropolitan newspaper used to be a thing that was possible. Um, this was uh, a way to uh, ask questions about the world, write about the world, um, granted in a somewhat um, form of enforced mediocrity, that is to say, uh, the 10 inch, 12 inch news story, inverted pyramid. Um, it's, it's, it, it's brutal and efficient and sometimes it can strip the color away from your prose, but it's a way to make a living, which I did. Um, um, and, uh, and until, um, the, the vitality slowly began to go out of the business. Um, uh, the, the ambition and the staffs were shrinking. I could kind of read the writing on the wall and I left the Arizona Republic um, in 2003, after just a, a period of, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, existential drifting, unhappiness, so forth. Uh, it was then that I got put in touch with a literary agent who encouraged uh, the writing of a book proposal uh, about uh, the diamond business, which that resulted in uh, eventually in, in my first book called The Heartless Stone. Now, back up a minute to the disillusionment with the newspaper business. You, you sound, sounds like you're saying, you know, the momentum was was being lost. Now, did this coincide with the advent of, or the rise of the Internet? Yes, certainly. Um, the pillar of the um, prosperity of newspapers rested on classified ads. That was approximately 60 percent of their income. Um, this is this is where. Uh, the money had always lain in newspapers since the early 19th century. Um, some local apothecary wants to put in an ad for a new potion down at the, uh, at the drugstore. And you put it in the newspaper and that's how it makes money. And, and news and information is what draws people into that economic product. 
um, if with the advent of um, uh, digitized classified ads, Craigslist and so forth, uh, the, the need to uh, advertise your lawnmower uh, in the newspaper, the need to advertise your uh, used Buick, um, that was gone in a shocking, shockingly compressed period of time. It didn't take a generation for this to land. It took um, only seven to 10 years for uh, the effects really to be felt. Yeah, they just they they just disappeared. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that a, a full page of classified ads and remember back in the day, there were pages of them were brought in more revenue than a full page display ad bought by, you know, uh, some some uh, big advertiser. Uh, you didn't have to pay a lot for the classified ad. But when you added up all the lines on that page on a on a um, broadsheet newspaper, it, it really added up to a lot of money. But it made so much sense that it would go online because it was it was so much uh, it was searchable instead of just looking for the headline and then going down ad by ad looking for what you're looking for. But it was yeah it was devastating. It was uh, uh, really killed off um, a tremendous uh, amount of the newspaper business. I mean literally sure. driving some those, of them out of business. Yes, all those executives, by the way, that uh, paid themselves such handsome salaries at uh, media corporations uh, such as Gannett. They should have seen this coming. Uh, they could have gotten ahead of it somehow. They could have uh, put their branding on it and made uh, free classifieds, free searchable digitized classifieds, uh, part of the the portfolio of what newspapers were doing. And instead, they they completely lost control of it. And so uh, that's I think a part of my historic resentment of. Uh, newspaper company executives, not just for the, you know, uh, stingy vision they had for the news, uh, but also their um, um, incompetence when it came to forecasting these trends. Yeah, it, it's, it was really one of those situations where they had a model that worked and uh, they didn't uh, see the train coming straight at them. They should have, like you said, it was obvious. It was obvious if you spent any time on it. Uh, just looking at the threats to your business. But um, that was, uh, I mean, really the internet kind of launched a whole new threat assessment. N industries, I mean, you even see Kodak that didn't see digital coming and got wiped out. Uh, now, and that's no excuse for uh, for the, new, the newspaper industry or for Kodak for that matter. But uh, it was one of those deals where um, uh, disruption just became um, so prevalent and uh and the newspaper people yeah they were not they were not prepared at all at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. um so the first book on the diamond trade um tell me about how did that you wrote the book proposal uh your agent liked what he or she saw obviously found a publishing house that said we'll do this one um what uh what do you think the key was uh to to that what was it about the number one, the diamond trade? Why is that so interesting uh, to the publishing company and, and uh, potential readers? And then uh, um, what was it? What do you, is there anything about your proposal that you think kind of nailed it? Well, I had um, uh, borrowed a, a lot of money to go over to Africa to do the reporting. Uh, I had never been there before. Um, this is um, the place where I reported the first chapter was. Um, one of uh, the, 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 the true tragedy spots uh, on the continent, a place called the Central African Republic, former uh, French colony that had been um, the subject of just uh, heartless extraction uh, on the part of the French with um, uh, very little thought to infrastructure, um, transportation, education. Um, the nation uh, post-independence had been racked by a series of coups um uh income was about at that time one u.s dollar per day uh, per capita income and it was a, a big uh harbor for uh diamond smuggling because it lay across the river from the um, democratic republic of congo where a lot of the diamonds were uh, taken out of uh, a war zone and given a clean provenance this is during a time when the industry was waking up to the uh, image threat from what are called blood diamonds, which is to say uh, stones that uh, are mined in a war zone and whose sale is used to finance the ongoing prosecution of the war. Um, but it's very easy to get around the self-policing protocols that the diamond 
uh, industry had developed uh, as a in response. And um, the book attempted to show uh, not just the myriad holes in that um, in, in that case, um, but also get into the history of the diamond, why uh, it, it had been regarded as a token of love, um, how, how they're sold, how they're polished, um, how they uh, uh, become these empty chambers for the projection of our desires. Mm. And the title of that book is The Heartless Stone for our listeners. It's good. The title is The Heartless Stone, A Journey Through the World of Diamonds, Deceit, and Desire. You have written about a lot of really interesting subjects, uh, Tom. You write about trains, you know, riding the rails that created the modern world. You've written about uh, Island on Fire, I mentioned during the intro, that had to do with the ending of slavery in the British Empire. Uh, you've got one about uh, Arizona called Rim to River, which I assume is the uh, south rim of the Grand Canyon to the Rio Grande. Um, and then you've got one on uranium. Um you also have one called The National Road, Dispatches from a Changing America. Is part of the attraction to to your uh, to, to writing uh, books about these subjects that um, it's a personal adventure for you? For instance, with the train book, I believe you you rode a lot of trains, correct, around the world to, to do your, your uh, research on that. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What uh, attracted you to, I mean, I love trains myself, so it's, it's kind of a question I could almost answer, but what attracted you to, to trains to the extent that you wanted to do an entire book? Well, um, <laughs> the root of it was in a phone call, actually. A friend of mine, a guy named Mark Herman, and I were uh, talking one day, and he uh, just sort of asked the question, which is a, a fairly common question, why uh, uh, why are European nations so well wired when it comes to uh, getting around, not just ordinary suburban business commuting, but also being able to get from major cities to the countryside um, with, with uh, at low cost and with little trouble. Why isn't the United States like that when the United States was the world leader in railroads um, in the, in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century? And I said, gosh, I don't know. I historically, I don't know the answer to that question. And, it led to uh, an idea of charting um, rail travel uh, as a, a force in uh, global society that determined uh, the shape of our cities, the sound of our music, the way wars are fought, uh, food production, uh, the way cities are uh, laid out. Uh, all kinds of uh, things can be uh, attributed to this tremendous economic and social force of the railroad. And uh, the book was structured as a series of journeys um, that would try and explain that. Uh, for example, the uh, story about the birth of the steam engine and the smooth whales on smooth rails uh, reported from Britain, uh, an end-to-end -end journey uh, from the, uh, um, the, the the very north end of, uh, of, of the main uh, island of Britain uh, all the way to uh, Land's End in Cornwall. Now, is there a, a a global standard in terms of the rails and in, in the width of them? The reason I even ask this question, Tom, well, a couple of reasons, one of which is, is, is normally once we start to talk about these things, for instance, uh, technology of any kind, it seems that now we start to say we should probably standardize this so, so it could be more widespread and everybody's playing on a, on the, on the same field. Uh, but also, one of the things I learned about the whole invasion of uh, Ukraine is that Russia had their rails uh, at a wider or narrow, I believe it was a wider width, so that uh, an enemy state could not just come rolling into, into their country on a train um, or, or use uh, their rail system uh, as part of their, their um, uh, method of attack. Yes, uh, the gauge wars are um, a, a tremendous parable uh, for understanding um, um, not just that sort of uh, military uh, defensive maneuver that you mentioned, uh, but also corporate uh, uh, monopolistic dominance. Uh, the way that uh, uh, in the early days of the railroad, the standard gauge, as it was called, set by uh, George Stevenson was four feet, 8.5 inches, which is uh, still the standard gauge in the U.S. But some companies deviated from this in order to um, make it so that uh, competitors would not be able to use uh, engines and carriages on their tracks. 
this this was also uh, a way to uh, prevent that um, invade that invasion by a railroad. Which uh, what what a scary thing to have uh, an invading power commandeer your tracks. And so uh, famously, um, Spain, uh, you know, in in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars, decided to not just uh, mount up a, a hide behind the natural barrier of the Pyrenees, uh, but also gauge its tracks in such a way that was it was did not conform to the French system. Mm. Uh, Mongolia and uh, China have uh, to this day the same disunion in, uh, in, the, in the matter of gauge. Now, uh, in terms of the United States, we move a lot of product by rail. But passenger travel is not uh, what what it is in, say, European countries. Uh, you know, this this is part of the 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 calculus in writing the book. Uh, what did you discover anything? I mean, when it comes to 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 rail to uh, um, to cargo via rail, is the United States as developed as as any kind other country in the world? But then it's the passenger rail system that we really don't seem to have a, a lot of um, affinity for? Yes, that's exactly correct. Um, uh, cargo rail is uh, uh, very efficient in the United States uh, in a way that it's not in Great Britain, where uh, most of the goods are transported um, by uh, by truck, by lorry. Um, it's uh, the passenger rail that uh, is, is really, uh, by global standards, certainly an embarrassment in the United States. What what happened with passenger rail? I mean, it, if we if we d developed a rail system, and it was a, a source of national pride, uh, why did we not see that uh, moving people uh, made a lot of sense as as well? Do you have an answer to that? Yeah, I mean, it was always um, a bit of a loss leader for the for the U.S. rails um, because of the way that. You need to uh, service passengers in a way that you don't need to service cargo. Passengers have biological needs. Um, they uh, they can be un unpredictable, whereas there's a, a predictability to freight. Uh, what happened was after uh, World War II, uh, Europe was, of course, in smithers. Um, much of the many of the tracks had been bombed. Uh, there was a massive package of um, of uh, global financial aid aimed at rebuilding the European continent. And uh, this money got uh, distributed to existing bureaucracies that were able to handle it. And in Europe, uh, France, Germany, et cetera, uh, enormous resources, political prestige was tied up in the rail ministries. So uh, when it came to accepting these, these bags of money, uh, that that was a natural place for it to go and to repair um, all of these uh, vital uh, connectors between cities, which um, uh, had been left ruined. Uh, the United States did not have that problem. Uh, there was no need to rebuild uh, ruined tracks. Uh, there there was a need, however, to um, uh, connect uh, growing suburbs with city cores with um, something uh, efficient and flexible, that is the automobile. Um, Detroit uh, had a big lobbying presence in, uh, in, in Washington. Uh, the Texas oil industries were um, um, flexing an enormous amount of clout, and they worked together to um, convince uh, Eisenhower and the Congress of the need for a federal interstate system. Uh, certainly Eisenhower wanted it for his own reasons, uh, which is to say the fast evacuation of cities in the event of a nuclear attack. And he famously had been impressed by the uh, German autobahns when uh, when he was a, uh, uh, a young general right after World War I uh, crossing the European continent. Interesting. So um, let me ask you about your book, The National Road, I, the subtitle, again, is Dispatches from a Changing America. It's a really um, divided time in America. A lot of people feel like the country is changing, maybe changing too rapidly, not changing for the best. 
Uh, give us a sketch uh, of the book. What did you discover in terms of how, how things are changing in America? Well, in a number of ways, I've got a, uh, a chapter there on uh, dollar general stores, um, the rise of uh, uh, what's called uh, little box uh, retail as opposed to big box retail. Um, these uh, kinds of um, um, really impressively laid out um, successors to the five and dime which you see in uh, small towns across the United States that have lost their uh, their main street merchants and it's a it's a real mixed blessing I mean this does get uh, cheap goods into the hands of uh, people who um, don't have a lot of money to spend on uh, on basic items um, but uh, if Dollar General is moving into your town, it's generally not a good sign. They they tend to target uh, uh, declining communities. That's a that's a way that uh, the United States is changing. Another another way is uh, that we're just not moving around as much as we used to. Um, uh, today's Americans have uh, changed zip codes at a lower rate than almost uh, in, any time uh, in our history um, since the 1920s. We, we why is that? We're we're tending to stay in place. Um, this is the, the the flexibility of work on the internet for one thing. Um, for another thing, it's uh, the stagnation of wages, um, the ways that uh, uh, people tend to uh, struggle to find work in some of these uh, declining areas, and they just don't move out of them. Hmm. Interesting. So how did that idea come about? You know, uh, I just had all these ideas about the United States that I had witnessed um, during my years as a newspaper reporter, and it just seemed like I wanted to put it between uh, two covers. Um, um, all of these uh, d disparate, almost uh, impressionistic portraits of this uh, in incredible place that we call the United States. Um, one of my greatest influences is a... Um, uh, a former reporter, actually, for the Chicago Daily News, a guy named John Gunther, who uh, is best known for writing a series of books called Inside, that is Inside Europe, Inside Africa, Inside USA. I had read Inside USA at a uh, at a young age. I was in my teens, maybe. And uh, this book was published in 1950. It was a, a narrative catalog of uh, uh, of the country. Uh, written at both a short and, and, and long distance, which is to say it reported on, you know, who's the governor of Kentucky? You know, what's what's the state of the um, the Florida citrus business? Um, th th those sorts of things, which are obviously uh, malleable. But he made many durable observations uh, about the American character that really hold up through the years. And so um, if, if, if that book had a uh, an avatar, it would have been uh, Gunther. Hmm. Yeah, I want to ask you about one more of your books, and then I want to talk about um, what you teach at Chapman, how you teach at Chapman and at Dartmouth, and um, and also talk about what you're um, going to be, what you're working on now or going to be working on next. So Rim to River is the one I wanted to ask you about. You, It's subtitled Looking into the Heart of Arizona. Now, you, you grew up in Tucson. You, you right. know you and you've worked in the state do you know a great deal about it is that why you picked arizona or is arizona kind of a singularly uh fascinating uh state among the 50 yeah both those things are true um it's uh i i argue that um much of uh what what happens in america uh or will happen in america is is um you you, you can see the the foretaste of it happening uh, in Arizona. It's a place that I just have never been able to get uh, uh, out of my system. In 2019, I took it upon myself to walk across it uh, from the north border at Utah to the southern border at Mexico. That was a journey of uh, 790 miles. And, and you uh, walked was, the whole thing. I walked and the you, whole thing. And you did it your, by yourself. Yes. What time of year was that? Mm, that was September to November. Okay, so the cooler weather, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there's a lo lot of threats uh, other than just the uh, scorching hot summers. There's uh, rattles <laughs> rattlesnakes and all kinds of other things. What what did you um, um, 
I'm just curious whether you ran into any um, any precarious situations along the way where you felt threatened. No, uh, there was one point where I uh, came close to running out of water, um, which uh, was a bit terrifying. It was out, of course, in the middle of nowhere. And um, I was just very, very lucky that uh, certain springs were, were flowing. So you knew where these springs were, but they don't flow uh, continuously. Yes. So you Um, were, and this is, this was good, pure water. Um, but, but you were, yeah. So you kind of lucked out at the same time. Yeah, I mean, you know where the springs are, um, thanks to uh, GPS. The, the 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 real X factor is whether they happen to be flowing or not, or whether they've gone dry. So uh, what did you, um, um, if you, if people were, a lot of people aren't very familiar with Arizona. They know it exists. They haven't necessarily been there. It's a state of, of, of big contrast. I mean, you've got everything from low desert to high desert. You've got a media crater. You've got Flagstaff at 6,000 plus feet above sea level and uh, lots of skiing and cool summers, um, the Grand Canyon and so on. Uh, what, what would you tell somebody about that particular book that um, um, kind of is uh, maybe some of the takeaways? Well, um, the, the, the walk itself is used to structure um, 17 essays uh, about about the place, uh, similar to the book about the United States, just um, um, kind of a narrative portrait, you might say. Uh, I've got essays in there about copper mining, um, about the state's history of violence, about the novels that have been uh, written about it, uh, how politics really works at the state capitol, um, um, a section on um, the extreme partisanship of Arizona. Um, uh, all the things that um, uh, non-natives should know and that natives can appreciate. Now, would you say today uh, the partisanship is not quite what it used to be? I mean, it, it's become basically a purple state, correct? Uh, correct, but it's it, it reflects the United States in this way that um, you've got uh, suburbs turning blue and um, the rural area is going even more red. Right. Yeah. We definitely see a lot of that. Um, did you, were you inspired in writing that book by, and I don't know the timing on this, but, but Bill Bryson, who's written uh, some terrific books, um, did one called a walk through the woods. Uh, did that inspire you at all? Was that, um, uh, the inspiration or was it influential at all for you or have you even read it? Yeah, it's a good book. Um, uh, another of uh, Bryson's books, which doesn't get nearly enough uh, attention, it's actually his first book called The Lost Continent, which is a uh, uh, an account of a road trip, sort of like uh, Blue Highways by William Lee Steed Moon or Travels with Charlie. Uh, it's, it's Bryson's own uh, kind of motoring journey uh, through his uh, his home country after spending a decade in Britain. It's pretty good. Now you, um, so you're a nonfiction writer. I mean, this is actually a fiction podcast, but I have nonfiction writers on from time to time. We had the great Gay Talese on here before, and there's so much to be learned from anybody who writes really, uh, writes professionally. What about, and I believe, check me on this, but I believe you tried your hand at fiction writing, just decided you liked the nonfiction writing better. Um, is w Was that the case? And what I'm leading towards is kind of the distinctions that you see between writing fiction and writing uh, narrative nonfiction. Sure. I think writing fiction is tremendously difficult. Um, my hat is off to anyone who can do it. Uh, I certainly have tried. I don't think I have much talent for it. Um, the creation of a verisimilitude between um, what's on the page and, and what makes sense in real life. I mean, that's very easy to do with nonfiction. You just simply, you know, um, observe and depict. Um, with, with, with fiction, um, that's, that's a whole nother step. And, um, I just don't think I've been able to convincingly pull it off. Mm, gotcha. Hey, I want to get back to Arizona for a minute because one of the uh, question I kind of uh, vaulted over has to do with the U.S. southern border, which is such a uh, politically loaded, uh, well, all of our, our, our borders with Mexico. Um, and you grew up in Tucson. You probably have a better feel for this than, than your average American. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the U.S. southern border and this whole immigration thing we've got going on? Oh, boy. Um My my own view, uh, this is a tremendously complicated subject, but uh, 
my 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 own view is that it's somewhat overblown um that the border is um um been porous uh ever since the Gaston purchase of uh of the 1850s that this is a vital uh, economic lifeline uh not just for um uh, laborers from Central and uh, uh, Central America and Mexico, uh, but also a lifeline for the Southwest, also a lifeline for industrialized cities, for farms in North Carolina, factories in Chicago. Uh, if that were to disappear um, through some sort of mythological perfect enforcement, um, it would be a catastrophe. And so uh, to some extent, um, uh, we, we, we live in a state of of uh, studied denial uh, about the importance of having um, somewhat of a, a less than sealed border. Now, uh, th that isn't to say that I think open borders is necessarily a good idea. Um, there, there, there should be uh, some control, some, some form of uh, enforcement. Uh, but the idea, uh, certainly, and this is a very easy straw man to shoot down, um, the idea of uh, an invasion uh, of our southern border, of a poisoning of our society. That's that's pure nonsense. Yeah, and that, that that's the vernacular that that uh, we're hearing today. Um, there is a school of thought that money flows seamlessly across borders, information flows seamlessly across borders, products flow seamlessly across borders. Obviously, there are some restrictions. You know, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping don't don't allow certain information to come into their country or certain products uh, and, and so on. But by and large, all of that stuff flows freely. It is all part of the circular global circulatory system. And the argument is labor needs to, to flow freely as well because it goes to where the jobs are. And if there aren't jobs, they don't go there because <laughs> there's, there's nothing there for them. Uh, but it's not really seen um, that way in this country. And again, I'm not trying to make an argument that we should have no controls at just a open border. Uh, but there, it's an interesting argument that uh, what makes an economy work uh, all over the economies all over the world work is that freedom of movement of money, product, information, but not so much labor. That's where we kind of are push people push people back. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Tom. Well, yeah, I mean, the idea that uh, somehow uh, we're getting ripped off, um, the, the, the numbers just don't show that. Uh, the fact is uh, that um, migrants pay um, uh, 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 millions of dollars in taxes. Um, it, every serious study has show, shown that they commit crimes at a, uh, at a rate less than that of U.S. Mm -hmm. citizens. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't I, get publicized very much at all. They, no. they, they have much more to lose. It's kind of like if I commit a crime, now I'm a problem. I could be deported. So I have a bigger incentive not to commit any crimes. Um, and, and they come from a culture, I think, and often, oftentimes where law and order is is the rule. I mean, it's supposed to be the rule everywhere, but it's not as a not everybody's a, as observant um, about that everywhere. Um, anyway, go ahead, Tom. I kind of. No, that's you're, you're making salient points. Um, they 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 come here um, to, uh, mainly to work, and um, for it's hard to make generalities, but most of them, you know, their their goal is to uh, get their families back home out of poverty through the remittances, and then eventually return home. Um, they um, try to keep their heads down while they're here, understandably so. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of people who don't understand what you what you just said, and that is that many of them want to go back to. They love their country. They want right. to go back. Um, they're 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 here for exactly the reason that you said, and eventually they decide they want to go back. You know, I've worked with Filipino people who are here legally, and they say, when I retire, I'm going back to the Philippines. It's you know, it's far from an invasion. It's you know, the the opportunities here. I take advantage of that opportunity, pay my taxes. Also keep the United States younger than a lot of other countries because we have immigration. Well, Italy and Japan and a lot of other countries are aging badly um, because they don't uh, really invite immigration or just aren't attractive. Russia is another country, but you know who wants to go to Russia? Not that many people are interested, but the fact that we attract young immigrants has kept our country from um, becoming aged out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So let me ask you about um, 
you're teaching. Uh, you teach at Chapman and you teach at Dartmouth and uh, your subject matter is writing, correct? Yes, I teach creative writing. Uh, talk about what, I mean, there there is the argument that a lot of people, you know, you either get it or you don't. Um, presumably the people who come to your class are people who do get it, they recognize they get it and they're trying to to bone up on their skill level and experience. How do you teach creative writing? What are some of the, the, the tactics or is there anything you tell your students on day one that kind of sets the frame? Well, all good nonfiction um, uh, operates on two levels. There's the literal uh, subject material. Uh, and then there's the, 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 the larger subject that uh, kind of floats above it, sort of like atmosphere over a planet. And sometimes you can see it. That is to say, sometimes it's named. Um, other times it's uh, a little bit more invisible and a little harder to grasp. And um, uh, understanding the... Um, the the ways that there's two two pistons to this engine, I think, is really key in in making um, your nonfiction work. What about um, now? You're teaching at Chapman, but then you're also teaching at Dartmouth. Is is that a virtual? Or I mean, do you go to Hanover, New Hampshire, or do you teach virtually? Uh Uh, I used to go to uh, Hanover. Uh, that's true uh, every summer, but uh, that's a part of my bio that probably uh, is in for summer of vision. We just had our second kid and uh, that's making it uh, increasingly hard to justify <laughs> being away for uh, three months at a time. So uh, I haven't, uh, haven't uh, been on the roster there uh, since 2020. uh 22 and uh um, i'm hoping to get there 2025 but we'll see I, it's obviously not a decision i get to make on my own Gotcha. So who are some of the, um, I'm curious as just who some of the authors are who inspired you, whether, whether fictional, whether they're, whether they're writing fiction or nonfiction, uh, were there people who inspired you maybe to get into journalism to begin with, or to make the decision to get into the book writing? Sure. Um, I already mentioned uh, John Gunther. Um, let's see. I, as a kid, I used to watch uh, Nightline. Remember Ted Koppel? Oh, yeah. 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 Boy, did I, I admire his uh, his interview style, um, you know, to, to the point, uh, unflappable. He had a certain kind of a lawn, the way that he was. He would ask those questions. Um, um, and that show came out. What what was the big uh, global or national event that was happening that the launched Iran hostage, it? That's what it was. uh, Iran hostage crisis. And then it went on for decades. Yeah, went on I for agree decades. with you on with Ted Koppel. He what he he did bring a certain uh, style um, that was um, uh, really appealing and and really intelligent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as for as for uh, fiction. Uh, I like realism and nonfiction. I'll just mention too, uh, the novelist Richard Ford uh, was meaningful to me, as well as uh, Joyce Carol Oates. Joyce Carol Oates is on what her hundredth novel or so. something like that. She, she is yeah. so productive; it's it's uh, almost insane. Um, what are you looking forward to now? What are you working on now? Is it something you can talk about? Sure, uh, I've got a book coming out. Uh, fingers crossed next year. Uh, about the effect of um, what are called contraband camps, what were called contraband camps. These are um, uh, groups of uh, uh, formerly enslaved people who ran towards the lines of the Union Army in the opening days of the Civil War and created a, a massive challenge um, to uh, the North uh, in terms of uh, how they viewed Uh, freed people and uh, what they were going to do to have a permanent solution to um, the question of uh, emancipation. Um, I, I don't think this area has been studied nearly enough. Um, I'm also working on a, that's, that's all finished. It's just awaiting publication. Um, I'm now working on a book about um, uh, pot potential dam removal in the, in the Southwest. How would, how would it affect um, um Uh, re uh, landscapes and communities if we were to take out some of the dams that were uh, uh, erected uh, potentially too hastily um, in the 20th century. Now, uh, 
dams tend to generate a lot of, I mean, a big percentage of our, not a majority percentage, but a big percentage of the um, electricity in the United States is generated by hydroelectric power. Um, what percentage of dams, do you have any, any uh, do, do most dams exist for that purpose or are they uh, put into place to, to create, um, you know, lakes and recreational opportunities and to, and to protect certain areas? Uh, hydroelectric was always sort of a nat on, um, it's, it's, it's a minuscule level of the U S baseload. Um, the, the major purpose of dams was, uh, was water storage and flood control. So the, um, uh, how serious is that being looked at in terms of, okay, well, what if we were to take these dams down? Uh, is that, it's a serious conversation these days, or is it one of those things that we're not, we're just not going to go go back, and, and and there may even be prohibitive costs involved. I don't know. I think it should be a more serious conversation, and particularly in an era of uh, greater strain on water supply, uh, in, in an era where we have uh, um, uh, an inability to predict predict future droughts. Um, I think we need to seriously look at taking down some of these obsolete dams. We've seen successful examples of this in the Pacific Northwest for reasons having to do with fish habitat. Uh, I'm curious about um, what it would be, what it would entail to restore uh, free, free flowing um, rivers in some places where the rivers have not flowed in a long time. And um, would that actually be a benefit um, to the rest of the country um, to gradually uh, phase out um, high moisture crops like uh, hay and alfalfa, feed crops mainly, and uh, take that out of the desert southwest and maybe re restore it to uh, areas of greater moisture where it's, you know, more appropriate. Now, you you have written about a variety of subjects, uh, you know, disparate subjects. Uh, what, what interests you? I mean, if you were to um, kind of round up round it all up and just say, when I th think in terms of writing a book, a story, um, this is, this is kind of the kind of overlay of what interests me. I've never been successful at answering that, uh, that question. It's a good question. I, I think, um, you, a word you hear a lot in publishing is branding, right? What's your, what, what's your specialty? What, what corner of the, um, uh, of the world of fact, have you have you you know staked your flag out on? I've never been able to do that. So you come across these subjects. Uh, it might be a conversation. You might be uh, uh, paying attention to the news. You learn about something. You're interested, and you decide let's. Well, do you decide let's go, or do you go to your agent and say this is what I'm thinking about doing? Is it saleable? There's three questions that I think every author needs to ask uh, before they. Uh, start off on something like this. Um, the first question is, um, is this really a book or is this a magazine article? Um, I think we've all read books that probably shouldn't have been written or should have been written in much smaller form and put into a literary journal or uh, perhaps a magazine of ideas, um, but probably do not deserve uh, 80,000 words, 100,000 words. Um, that That's a very important question that needs to be asked at the get-go. The second question is, am I going to be comfortable um, marinating in this topic for a year and a half or two years where, you know, I won't get sick of it, where I'll be, you know, happy to chase this stuff down and that, you know, there's there, there's a replenishing well of interest here? Or is this going to be something that I'm going to quickly grow tired of? Um, or God forbid, there's just not enough material here and I'm going to be chasing after scraps. Um mm -hmm. The third question is, um, it's, 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 this one is the hardest to determine. Does the universe really need this book? Um, it, it, is there a thirst for this in terms of it making a contribution? Is this going to uh, be something that will be of benefit to the rest of the world? Or um, is this merely um, something that's there to flatter the author's ego, um, that they just want to be an author and it doesn't really matter what they're doing? Um, um, we've all read books like that, that 
probably should not have been written because the universe really just didn't need the book that had already been said before, or the subject was too thin, or the author's heart clearly was not into it for whatever reason. So uh, those are the three questions I like to ask. Um, Interesting. Yeah. You know. So you tell your students that as well. And what do you see as the biggest uh, issue when you're teaching students and you're looking at the writing, you give them their assignments and so on. What are maybe give us a, an issue or two or three that you think are uh, that maybe the toughest for them to overcome or the the kind of the biggest problems in achieving what they're looking to achieve? Sure. Uh, perfect. Perfectionism is a killer. Um, you got to give yourself permission to just be an OK writer. You know, not every sentence is going to be beautiful. Um, don't worry too much about impressing the reader. Uh, just simply uh, tell tell a story using simple subject verb sentences uh, in its own way. And all, as terrifying as it is, um, uh, AI is actually a pretty good prose stylist when it comes to um, s simple, plain vanilla sentences. It's a good way to write. I don't love the uh, the coming AI revolution, but I do have to uh, credit the uh, uh, the men behind the screen for um, giving uh, AI a, um, 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 a a readable kind of register. Yeah, it is very straight ahead. No question about that. Um, interesting. So, how has your um, how has your writing changed with age? Your writing and your interests, maybe they're interrelated, I would imagine. So how is your writing style or the way you approach writing and the things that you're interested in writing about changed as you've gotten older? That's a good question. I, I haven't really thought about that. Um, at least when it comes to myself, I, I will be reading the work of others and I'll think to myself, this is a young person's prose style. Um, and, and I mean that in both good and bad ways. Sometimes it can be um, uh, juvenile and undisciplined and trying too hard and full of uh, uh, flash that just isn't working. But sometimes there can be a vigor behind it and uh, a, 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 a limpidity, a, a fluidity with the, the, the language that just comes across as very youthful. And I'm not talking here about cultural references of the young. I'm just talking about... Um, a, a certain quality of it. Um, I, I'm wondering how that's uh, that's affected me. I've now been doing this for more than 30 years, and so you'd think that uh, I would see a change the way that you see a change on your own face in the mirror in the mornings, right? I'll have to get back to you on that. Yeah, well, and you know, it's probably so gradual. Um, I think sometimes you just you look in the mirror, look at your own face. And we see that slow evolution, but the person who hasn't seen us for 10 or 20 years is like, whoa, I mean, they probably are going to be too kind to say, wow, you've aged quite a bit, pal. <laughs> but but it's such a gradual thing that when you're observing it, and then, of course, your writing style and your interests are going to to uh, gravitate uh, probably fairly slowly. Uh, I don't think too many people have a revolutionary sort of sudden sudden change unless there's some kind of trauma in their lives, a, a major loss or something something like that. Mm -hmm. um, is there a subject that you have had in the back of your mind that you want to write about, but it's been just a, a timing issue or there's some other impediment, but you still are thinking in terms of this is a subject I want to write about. Now I might be asking you a question. It's like, sure, Mike, but I don't want to tell you <laughs> because people are, because <laughs> people are going to jump the gun on me. But even if it exists, even if it does exist, if the answer is yes, um, I'd be curious to know what kind of impediments stand in the way. Sure. Uh, well, this summer I was going to go back to my dad's hometown in Kansas and uh, write an essay about uh, life in a small town. I've been going to this place uh, um, as, I don't want to say a tourist, that's not quite right, because you know it's always been in the uh, context of a family that that's hailed from this town and people who knew my great grandfather and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, I, I had meant to, uh, to go out there this summer and just, uh, stay for about a week. But again, uh, I'm a dad of young children and, um, the, the, the travel has been hard to arrange. Well, Tom, I really appreciate you taking the time and coming on the program. Um, uh, this, uh, the, the, again, the subject matter, it's far ranging and, uh, you've, uh, been at it for quite a while. I also like the, um, um, 
you know, obviously I was interested in that, uh, but we've traveled some of the same territories and all. Um, appreciate your time and best of luck with your new projects. Thanks, Mike. It's been good being here.